This is Duke University. And we thought it would be useful to have a, a kind of interview discussion with Pascal first, and we'll uh, be doing that over the next uh, hour and a half or so. And then at 2 o'clock, we would do something similar with, with Annabelle. Uh, and so the way we've uh, set this up is that uh, Fritz Mayer and myself, so Fritz is professor in the Stanford School of Public Policy, and I'm professor of sociology, uh, and I direct the Center on Globalization, Governance, Competitiveness, that we could um, ask uh, uh, Pascal and me some questions related to some of the themes of this conference, so we can get a chance to hear in a more of an in-depth fashion uh, some of his experience and thoughts on these, uh, on these issues. And then we would uh, open it up uh, uh, to the audience uh, for some of your uh, comments and questions. I will give a, a much, uh, I'll give a more detailed introduction to Mr. Lamy tomorrow evening before his keynote address, but let me just uh, mention that he's particularly important for purposes of this meeting because he was uh, a two-term director general of the World Trade Organization between 2005 and 2013. And in those eight years, uh, a lot was happening in the global economy, in particular the, the economic recession of 2008-2009 uh, created a lot of uh, uh, perturbations in the trade system, but also I think WTO um, uh, really was playing a, uh, a leadership role in terms of trying to interpret changes in the global economy, especially the trade system, uh, for what that means for developing countries and, and the global economy uh, more generally. Um, also, uh, Mr. Lamy served uh, as a trade commissioner for the European Union, so he and he held various posts in France. So he combines a position from national policymaker, EU commissioner, but especially director general of the World Trade Organization. So what Fritz and I would like to do is each will sort of alternate in asking a couple questions to allow uh, Pascal to, to give his thoughts on uh, some of the themes we're going to be dealing with, and I think I'll kick it off. Uh, in the following way. As I was saying, I think the, the World Trade Organization has been, was a critical uh, organization in the, uh, the eight year period that you served as director, um, not, not only in dealing with a lot of trade issues, but in particular in uh, starting to focus on global value chains as a conceptual framework that somehow was useful mm -hmm to an international organization and, uh, and to the countries that you were also serving. So maybe we could begin, Pascal, by you telling us a little bit how and why global value chains emerged as an important framework or theme uh, in your term as Director General of WTO. Well, that's a long story. Uh, and let me start by saying that I'm still uh, amazed uh, reading about WTO, uh, hearing about WTO, at uh, uh, how dramatized the WTO is in public perception. When you read the media or we listen to radio or TV, you know, it's near to death. And then, whoop, day of resurrection. Mm -hmm. And then a fortnight later, burp, Die again. So, 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 you know, incredible drama, which I think uh, makes no sense uh, because what WTO is about is opening trade. Huh? So, that's what WTO is about. And the only element of judgment which I think one should have about WTO is whether trade is more open or less open. Now, the reality, the facts show that trade is more open than it was, and it was more open than it was before, including during this uh, big uh, economic uh, crisis, which I think was a good 
stress, stress for the system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, going back to your question, if one starts from this idea that WTO is about opening trade, and there's the whole issue of why and how and in which conditions opening trade works, and what the conditions you need to gather for this to work, and what the distribution of these, okay, that's leave that, leave that aside. Let's sum up the thing to trade opening. Trade opening is about removing obstacle to trade. Now, what I realized when I was DG of WTO, and I would then at some stage disclose how Annabelle and myself got acquainted, because this needs to be disclosed. Uh, what I realized after a few years, and especially after the failure of the 08 uh, negotiation moment, which nearly got it done, is that there was a big and growing difference uh, between what I was hearing talking to business people and what I was hearing talking to trade negotiators. And I was struck by the fact that with time, the difference was growing. Every year when I you know, tried to compare these two things, the gap was growing. And I, I was puzzled by this because it's intellectually strange that the world of people who trade and the world of trade negotiators are more and more different. I mean, for a French rational mind, it's <laughs> puzzling. And second, of course, it probably has operational consequences on the way WTO addresses its basic core business, which is eliminating obstacles to trade. And this, is, this, this was how I came uh, to this notion uh, that people who trade are in the real world, what I call the new world, and people who negotiate trade agreements are in the old world. And we are in this transition between the old world and the new world. Like all transitions, it's a very interesting period. But the problem being that if trade negotiators remain in the old world for 10 more years, this is bad. This is bad because they don't address the real issues which will help opening trade, hence creating the necessary efficiencies. And again, I'm not saying it works by miracle. There are specific conditions on which it works. So this is, this is where, this is the origin of, of, my, of my reaction. And it, I came progressively to realize, again, listening to business people, remembering, and that's a coincidence, uh, that I had been uh, acquainted with uh, Jetro. Uh, which is the uh, research arm of uh, MITI in Japan in the early 80s. Uh, coincidentally, I was then chief of staff of Jacques Delors. And Jacques Delors was not a big, let's say, Jap fan for a variety of reasons. So as his chief of staff, I was the one that was interacting with Japan. And the Japanese people knew that, so they were coming to me. And at the time, they had launched a big study. Uh, that was the time where Japan was invading the world. Remember all this literature? You know? And a number of Japanese politicians started saying, well, that's a problem for us. So we should ask our people in MITI to look at that and you know, find a different narrative. And so the people of MITI commissioned the people of Jetro. And the people of Jetro starting to, started doing these numbers. And they started this invention of calculating trade in value addition instead of volumes. That was in the 80s. And I, I happened to know that. 
Now, then this sort of big Japanese threat over the world disappeared. You know, the sun went back where it is, basically. And these studies were on shelf. And they, the politicians never had to use what Jethro had told them, which is, if you look at the real numbers, Japan is importing lots of what Japan exports. And so if we look at the real value addition, which is our role in trade, which you measure through the value addition, it's finally much smaller than it appears. That was, no, again, 25 years before. And the, like, like often in research, the thing was done for a specific purpose. The purpose disappeared. The research was there, shelved, and it reappeared you know, 25 years later. And this is where I picked it. And basically, trying to establish this reality, which I believe is the reality, that there is an old world of trade where production is national and trade is internation, and where obstacles to trade are measures, the purpose of which is to protect the producer from foreign competition. That's the old world of trade. The new world of trade is a world where production is transnational, global supply chain, this sort of you know, globalization, fragmentation of production systems for goods and services, by the way, which is more difficult to feature, uh, I mean, to imagine, but it's, it's also a reality, and where simultaneously obstacle to trade do not stem anymore from measures, the purpose of which is to protect the producer, but from measures, the purpose of which is to protect the consumer. Or more precisely, because this, this can be ambiguous, the obstacle to trade doesn't reside in the measure obstacle to trade resides in the differences in the measures. And this little nuance is hugely important because it's what creates <coughs> this ambiguity between the old world and the new world. In the old world, the system is simple. You get rid of the protection. In the new world, the system is very complex because you don't get rid of the precaution. If anything, precaution is going to grow. What you have to get rid of is uh, differences in levels and administration of precaution, which are obstacle to efficiency gain. Yeah? And that's how I thought things should be sort of, you know, the narrative. And this is where I launched, and Annabelle remember that. This is where I launched this Made in the World initiative, which came to my mind, again, after a lot of discussions with business people. But I remember one specific occasion, uh, which was the World Congress of Sport Equipment uh, Manufacturers. Uh, I had a Chinese with me uh, in my team at the time, uh, Wang Chaodong. And we together spent a day in München uh, in this yearly big you know, event they have where you, uh, you know, when you're talking to Mr. Nike, Mr. Adidas, uh, uh, Mr. Azik. So uh, I do a bit of sports, so it's a it's great occasion. Uh, these people are important people for many people, including for me. And I discussed that with them. And they sort of you know, did a sort of map, very simply these guys, and they knew what they were talking about, realized showing how what they were producing was produced, which were through basically Asian supply chains, and where it was sold, which was mostly in the West. So sort of 60, 70 percent Asian produced, 60, 70 percent Western sold, 
and then all the transformations and the different layers of value addition, including you know, branding and marketing and distribution costs. And it was so obvious that this was a totally integrated system. So then I launched the Mace in the World. And once the Made in the World got a bit of traction, I launched the Measuring Trade in Added Value, which again, I'm credited for having invented. <laughs> That's wrong. As I said, Jetro invented it. Uh, and I just, you know, I just reused it. Uh, and from a very simple reasoning, uh, which is that you know, the moment you measure GNP in summing value addition, uh, comparing trade in volume to GNP in value addition just makes no sense from an economic point of view. And so this is this is this is how this uh, this is how this happened, and this is how the sort of new narrative about again, uh, uh, production and addressing obstacle to trade. Uh, and I tried to push, the purpose of which was to bring these two worlds in the same place. Now, we are not there yet from far. So let me, let me push uh, a little bit uh, further on this, because I think the origins of this are fascinating, and, and also tracing it back to the Japan Inc. sphere of the 80s, when Japan was the dominant economy, and people were concerned. And that's important. But I think a lot of what becomes successful has to do with good marketing in terms of these ideas. And so your Made in the World initiative, I think, captured people's attention. And in particular, the example of the iPhone or the Nokia phone. I mean, things that people are aware of, and you can show how the differences in, in calculating numbers and the importance of value addition matters. But I'm curious then, how do you go from made in the world as a, a, uh, an important kind of initiative to global value chains as a particular concept? Because uh, over the last five, seven, eight years, it seems like a lot of international organizations have begun to use that term, that phrase, uh, global value chains or value chains, as a way to signify a lot of this these new world elements that you're talking about. So, was it important for you when you were doing uh, Made in the World to uh, uh, use the value chain label? Uh, and in particular, I mean, I think the trade and value added project that WTO and OECD launched and became very successful in creating the database yeah. did pick up on this kind of value chains notion. So what was the importance, if there was some, of the terminology or of the particular framework of of global value chains and pushing forward this, this new world of trade idea? No, I, I mean, the concept again was, in my mind, at the end of the day, very operational. How could this trade negotiator's agenda and the real trade agenda converge? Whereas I was worried by this divergence. You know, basically, in 08, the Doha round failed at that time, at least that part of the negotiation, roughly because of an incapacity of US and China to agree on a 3% tariff reduction on chemical products. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a simplification, but that's the real thing. Now, I never heard Dupont or Sinochem in conversations I've had with them talking about tariffs. Never. Never. I heard them a hundred times talking about non-tariff measures, about regulation, about reach, about traceability, about blah, blah, blah. I mean, which is the precaution and not the protection. So, in a way, in order for this agenda to reconverge, we had to frame the reality for trade negotiators in a way they could understand that they've got to change their, their mindset. They've got to change their software. And the, the description of these global value chains and how much 
this process had extended with its regional specificities, how much of the value addition was created at each side, how insignificant from an economic point of view, measuring trade in volumes has become when things are produced in you know, 5, 6, 10, 12 countries. Measuring trade in volumes, the more global supply chain expand, the more measuring trade in volumes say nothing but the size of the expansions of these value chains. Because volumes increase each time <laughs> it crosses a border. And that's, again, true for, for goods and for services, even if uh, measuring trade and services is a bit different. So the purpose was to try and, and change the lens of trade policy community so that they have the same lens as the trade practitioners. And then if you look at the numbers, and the OECD, of course, helped us a lot because they've got roughly three times more sort of research resources than the WTO on trade, and which says something about the topography of the international system. Uh, but we, we also you know, got these numbers from the IMF, uh, which I use a lot, which is that if you take the average import content of exports worldwide, it was 20% uh, 20 years ago. It's 40% uh, today, and it's going to be 60% 20 years from now. Now, if that's the reality, and that's what business people say, and that's what you can measure for the moment, you can't measure how it's going to be 20 years from now, but that's what they say, then this has a huge bearing on obstacle to trade and hence on the way to deal with obstacle to trade. Once you know, more than half of, your, of the value add of, of what you export, you have to import. Shooting on your imports makes absolutely no sense. Now, when it was 20%, there could be a discussion. When it's half, the discussion becomes a bit strange. The moment it's going to be 60%, the discussion is just senseless. And what this means is that measures to protect the producer, like tariff or subsidies, make no sense. Which is, in a way, a much more convincing argument than WTO disciplines tell you not to do that. Uh, there is something in humans, which is better than discipline, which is good sense. <laughs> and in fact, the, these, these global supply chains are a sort of good sense provider. People will realize, little by little, that it makes no sense to shoot on their, on their imports. Now, if that is true, and that's, what, you know, that's what's happening, then you have to look at not these old obstacle to trade, which are disappearing, uh, like the stars, the light of which you can see, although they've been dead for hundreds of years, but it takes a bit of time for the light to come to your eye. And then you have to focus your attention on what real obstacle to trade are. And real obstacle to trade are not in tariffs, or even in subsidies, although uh, there's quite a bit to be done still in the old world but they are in these regulatory discrepancies. And that's where, you know, that's where attention has to be if you go back to the sort of core business, which is opening trade, i.e. eliminate an obstacle to trade. And if, if I had to give, I, I couldn't do that at WTO DG because it's a bit of a simplification, but we can do that for this sort of occasion. If I listen to business people, and I still do a lot of that, including on things like TPP and TTIP, what is the topography of obstacle to trade today? If I'm an average exporter, huh? I'm a domestic producer, I want to go global. I have to pay 5%, which is the 
average trade weighted tariff. I have to pay 10% if I cross a border because of red tape and immobilization of my container and a bit of a, uh, jamming of uh, the port or the line uh, with trucks. And I have to pay 30% to cope with different regulatory standards which I have to match in order to market my product in a country. So the new topography of obstacle to trade is 5, 10, 30. Now, if you look at the topography trade negotiators and in their mind, uh, it's 90, 5, and 5. Or let's say 80, 15, and 5. And the reason why we got the 15 after three years of hard work is led to this trade facilitation agreement in Bali. And I, I was saying this this morning to <laughs> our friends. You know, it took three years to take this trade facilitation problem, which is basically border administration uh, issues, from the bottom of the list of the trade agenda to the top of the list, because trade negotiators hate discussing these greasy technical details which have to do with the way the machine room works. But the good thing was that that business really made the case that this 10% was too much. And we could bring it down to half of that with an agreement. And this is how it happened. But trade negotiators still have most of their mind focused on the 5%. Now, it's a simplification, because as we all know, an average trade weighted 5% is uh, the result of averages. And there are many tariff peaks around this. But so global supply chain is the leverage to get people's attention to what real obstacles to trade are about. And that's, I think, what's needed, what's needed for the future if we want you know, to keep reaping a number of efficiencies of trade opening. Great. Let me, let me uh, Pascal, let me follow up on that, on that briefly, and then I, will turn, I want to turn to a, a, a sort of widen the discussion to, to some of the things you've written about, uh, about uh, trade development. Um, um, just on this point, uh, you described uh, how, how we got the trade facilitation when we enlarged the percentage in the mind of the trade community about what, uh, how important that was. Um, you started, and you alluded to a part of the answer, I suppose, about how we get from the 5 to the 30 in, in, in this area. But I'm wondering, you know, in a first approximation, we have a system of, of uh, a set of organizations in the trade world, a set of habits, a set of practices to negotiate the Doha round, the bilaterals. What, what, to what extent uh, is, is this problem sort of baked in the system? That is, this, the, the structures, the habits, the institutions, and, and, and how do we, and you, you talked about sort of getting it in people's minds and, that's, and, and, and creating a new narrative, and I think that, that's surely part of it. But how, how difficult is it going to be to get from 5 to 30, given the institutional structures that we have? Uh, I, I, it's a very good question, and my answer is that this is very difficult for a variety of reasons. And the most, the best example of how difficult it is, is the, the poor shape of this TTIP negotiation, mm. huh? which is about the 30%. Huh? It's not about the 10%. I mean, US and EU customs are reasonably harmonized and modern, and you don't have to you know, change the way the planet works to make sure that an import declaration and an export declaration are the same in the same electronic system. The 5% transatlantic is 1, not 5. So the issue is with the 30. Now, it's a very, very different ball game. Very different. And I, I wrote this in a piece which you will find in English on the website of uh, notre the Institut Jacques Delors, which is a translation of a thing I wrote in French in uh, 
July. It's very different because it's not about trade-offs. Even, by the way, the trade facilitation in Bali was not about trade-offs. It was about regulatory harmonization. It was about administrative convergence. It was about making things more connected. But it wasn't, if you give me a right of appeal, uh, I will give you uh, uh, three uh, less uh, rubber stamping uh, uh, moments. Huh? It, wasn't, it wasn't a trade-off. No, it, it was transforming a trade-off because the thing was hype of India about protecting their poor farmers as if India was protecting its poor farmers. But let's leave that aside. Or, you know, can come back to that later. Uh, there was a sort of, you know, a sort of trade-off: uh, my farmers against uh, your customs procedures, which again, rationally, makes no sense. But even there, you let you you leave the sort of trade-off mentality, which is, you have tariffs on bicycles, I have tariffs on scrap metal. Let's do a good deal, because if we both lower our tariff, we'll be better off. And then the question is how much for you and how much for me. And I'm going, of course, trying to cheat you in making sure that you give a bit more than I would give. And that's, that's the mentality of trade negotiators. <laughs> trade negotiators are cheaters. Uh, they always try to get a lower price than what it's worth from their bargain. Uh, the problem is that you've got so many of them that it becomes a bit complex. And anyhow, mathematically, at the end of the day, the market gives you the real price. Because if everybody cheats everybody around, then the only solution is the real price. Huh? So that's, 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 that's the mentality about tariff negotiations, or even subsidy negotiations, because um, it's, it's the same sort of economic impact on protection. If it's about the 30%, i.e. Differences in safety of lighter, safety of toys, uh, safety of food, uh, maximum pesticide residues in flowers, the uh, size of bumpers of cars between EU and US. Trade off not only is not there, but mentioning that it could be a trade off is a huge political blunder because it creates a fear in public opinion that, in reality, you are going to, quote unquote, negotiate the level of precaution. Hence, raising you know, enormous fear uh, among uh, consumer organizations, for instance, uh, that uh, in order to open trade, you're going to dump precaution. So, it's, it's a totally different game. And, and the way you, to handle it is totally different. And again, I mean, I'm, and that's a point I, I wrote an op-ed uh, in the FT yesterday about how to try and save TTIP, basically. And I remake this point, which I think both sides, for the moment, haven't yet really grasped with, which is that if, if I'm a tariff negotiator, the, my political economy is I have uh, producers against me and consumers with me. I have consumers with me because they like lower prices, and I have producers against me because they don't like more competition. Now, if I'm in the business of precaution discrepancy addressing, it's the other way around. I have producers with me because they like the notion that they have a level, single level standard, because it's good for them, they will do more economies of scale. But I have consumer, or more precisely, consumer organizations against me. Uh, because consumer organizations are in the business of, you know, they're selling sort of paranoia. Uh, it's, it's virtuous paranoia. They, they, what they explain to their members is, be careful, I'm going to tell you that I'm reducing the risk for your health, for your pet, for what you care about. And I'm, I'm helping you facing this risk, this threat. 
Uh, so I, I have, you know, my legitimacy is in entertaining this notion that if I'm not there, there's a risk. Uh, that's, that's how I get support from, from my members. So again, it's, it's a totally different system. And I mean, the Europeans should have known that because basically that's what they did. And I remember that at the time. I was, I was chief of staff of the law at the time from 85 to 92 when, you know, when we did the internal market. I mean, many, Europe was a free trade zone. It was a common market, but it wasn't a single market. And in, in some ways, if you look at transatlantic, you roughly can say that it's a common market. There is very little classical obstacle to trade left, but it is not a single market because if you want to export, you still have to adjust to different standards, norms, and so on. So that's 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 where things have to go, and this is where, in many ways, the TTIP is the first of the big negotiations in this new world, whereas TPP is the last of the negotiations in the old world. Uh, T TPP. When you look at what TPP is about today, it's you know it's beef quotas, uh, rice tariffs. Uh, car uh, distribution systems, which is roughly the US-Japan trade agenda of the 70s. Huh? It hasn't changed. It's still the same. Whereas if you look at TTIP, the issue is about consumer production, data privacy, GMOs, chlorinated poultry, uh, and, and, all, and all that, which, which has a very different political vibration. Yeah. Um, Building on that, but but maybe widening the scope a bit. Uh, you you arrived at the WTO in the in the midst of the Doha, you know, in the early stages of the Doha round, I guess, uh, the Doha development round, um, and you've thought a lot and, and talked and written about and spoken about uh, the trade and development agenda, um, uh, different formulations that you've given. But at one point, uh, and, and you you published a book even by the by, uh, on the on the idea of a Geneva consensus to replace the Washington consensus. Uh, and as I take it, uh, uh, a way of thinking more broadly, uh, maybe even beyond trade, about what measures need to accompany trade in order that trade work for development, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, that it uh, human, I think you used the phrase, it, it humanizes globalization. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you could s say a bit more about what, what, it, what is different about the Geneva Consensus that, uh, from the Washington Consensus? Well, that's precisely why I wrote this book. The moment I stepped <laughs> down from WTO, I recovered my uh, freedom of speech, <laughs> <laughs> which is a great relief. Uh, I mean, the difference between I, I call it the Geneva Consensus, of course, on purpose. Roughly, the Washington Consensus, and I don't, I know Annabelle is now the trade czar in the World Bank, so I have to be careful about what I say. Uh, but the Washington Consensus basically says, liberalize, and God uh, will take care of the rest. The Geneva Consensus says opening trade works under some conditions which have to be met for it to work. That's, that's, the, that's the idea. Now, and these conditions are, some are sort of, I would say, upstream, and others are downstream. Some are upstream, which is the international and domestic conditions for the benefits of trade to outweigh the cost of trade. I mean, the reason why trade opening works for efficiency creation is very simple. Huh? It works because it's painful. It's painful because it works. It's a sort of pain gain game. I think economic theory uh, is. Uh, I mean, you've got 
enough economic theory to show why and how it's not a zero-sum game, huh? i.e. overall <coughs> the benefits outweigh the cost, but this is true overall, but depends very much on uh, uh, where uh, you look at, uh, at your numbers. So there are a number of conditions upstream. Some are from an international nature, which is the fairness of discipline. True, I mean, you, know, you can't pretend trade opening works if, uh, if uh, US uh, spends uh, $2 billion in subsidizing cotton. Uh, try and explain to a Burkina uh, producer that uh, trade opening works in these conditions. It's impossible. And Rightly so. So there are a number of things. Try and explain, and I, I'm sure uh, Annabelle will tell you about her, her experience when she was trade minister in her country. Uh, try and explain that uh, to uh, sort of a region of, uh, of uh, Kenya or Tanzania that trade opening works if the harbor of uh, Mombasa or Dar es Salaam uh, is totally clogged. Won't work. But it's not because trade opening doesn't work, it's because the harbor is clogged. And the measures that have to be taken are about declogging <laughs> uh, the harbor and improving the logistics and so on. So that's a snapshot on what I call upstream conditions for trade opening to work. Of course, the quality of supply systems and so on. And then you've got all the sort of downstream issues which have a lot to do with the distributional effects of trade opening, uh, which we know pushes out of the market people who were in the market because of comparative advantage uh, and their level of qualification has to change. Uh, and, and that's the whole issue of you know, the socioeconomic impact of trade opening. And we know full well that this depends a lot on domestic conditions. I mean, I've always been struck, including when I was a EU trade commissioner, look at Europe, textile and clothing. Uh, it's a very good case because it's the same trade policy. Europe is a customs union since uh, 1957, so it's a long time of observation. Same trade policy for these countries, at least, uh, let's say, the six and 12 original ones. And yet, totally different impact of the disappearance of textile uh, quotas in 05, huh? with some countries having done extremely well, like Sweden or Finland. Uh, and others having to do extremely poorly, like uh, Italy and Portugal, uh, at least at that time, uh, and some in between, like France or Germany. And where does the difference lie? The difference lies in the way they've handled their domestic politics, their supply side politics, the way trade unions and industry and regional authorities have discussed this, planned this, uh, you know, five, ten years in advance, or <laughs> all the week before and it makes a big difference. So it's, it's a good illustration of, of how much attention you have to put to these conditions in order for trade opening. And that's basically you know, the difference between what I dubbed the Washington Consensus. And I know they would tell me, you know, the Washington Consensus was more subtle. Yeah, I know that. Uh, but I think the if that's the case, the Geneva Consensus is even more subtle. <laughs> well, let me push actually on, on uh, beyond the Geneva Consensus uh, a set of issues. One of the most striking uh, features of the global economy over the last 10 years, I think from a lot of economic observers' point of view, is the rise of emerging economies, the big economies. You mentioned China as being the country that today is what Japan was like in the 1980s in terms of a uh, an, an enormously successful manufacturing exporter that wants to enlarge its role in the whole global system. But like China, we've got a number of other big economies, Brazil, South Africa, India, Indonesia, all, I, I think, trying to um, 
stake out a different role for themselves in the global system, especially vis-a-vis -vis international organizations like the WTO. And, and when we see a, a system going from a, a G7 to a G20, it seems like the rules of the game in terms of how you would, how you would try to fashion agreements or a consensus among these countries that works for everybody must be extremely challenging, in particular for an organization like WTO where trade issues are central. How, do, how in your period of uh, being DG for those eight years, but also looking forward, how can the uh, emerging economies be incorporated in the global trading system in a way that uh, allows trade rules or some sort of trade agreements to still be uh, a successful vehicle to bring countries together? I mean, in many ways, the WTO is the international organization where, which has the most flexibly and continuously adjusted to the change in geoeconomics. Because the way WTO works, you don't have a board. You don't have equity holders. Uh, you don't have a board uh, where uh, X and Y, Z are there because of it's, it's a general, it's a sort of permanent general assembly uh, with ministers or ambassadors. And uh, I mean, geoeconomic reweighting translates by itself. Uh, not least because, you know, contrary to what many people believe, the real power game in WTO is uh, importers, not exporters ones that hold the power of moving the system are important. That's something which you need to understand, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why, among other things, there was US leadership for, for a long time in, uh, in, this, in this organization in terms of driving the, the boat in, uh, in one direction. So in many ways, the WTO cannot fall under the sort of normal criticism which you have about the IMF, the World Bank board, the UN Security Council, that the power system uh, dates from old times and it hasn't adjusted. It is adjusting permanently. But where the WTO is, uh, I mean, is, is, is hit by the notion that uh, countries are emerging is because of its old principle of special and differential treatment. The notion that rich countries have to open trade on a reciprocity basis, trade off, uh, and then poorer countries because they are poorer and they don't have the same uh, supply capacity nor competition ability are given the benefits of this opening among developed countries for themselves with a relatively modest price for their own market opening. Although with time this price is meant to become less modest as they develop. And that has been the sort of ideological pillar of the GATT and remains one ideological pillar of the, of the WTO. Uh, the problem being that it's fine in the old world of trade when what you measure in terms of special and inflation treatment is protection. Well, yeah, I find good that you know, Africa has duty-free, quota-free on flowers. Uh, and yet they can keep a tariff on flowers. Okay, that's good. And it works. How long? The, the notion being that at some day, they all will be in a sort of paradise of uh, equal level of development. That's the mental assumption. Now, if it's in the world of precaution, this principle of special and differential treatment is dead. It's dead. Uh, nobody is going to say 
I have a tariff uh, of 30% uh, uh, on my flowers from Israel uh, and only 20% from my flowers from Costa Rica because Israel is more developed than Costa Rica and zero for Rwanda because Costa Rica is more developed than Rwanda, which is the principle of special and differential treatment. Nobody's going to say, I, I adjust my level of precaution in order to facilitate, because, you know, pesticide in roses are pesticide in roses. Huh? And the reason why you have a maximum pesticide residue is because it, pesticides are bad for the consumer. Now, whether the pesticide comes from Israel, Costa Rica, uh, or Rwanda, doesn't matter. Huh? So that's a huge difference. That's something which, in many ways, has not yet percolated, because that's true for the 30%. It's not true for the 5%, which can go on the SND, but it, it, it's not true for the 30%. And then you're left with, in the old world, the problem of classical obstacle to trade, and with this issue, which cannot be solved for the moment, uh, which is, as I've often said, including when I was WTO DG, is China a country with uh, many poor and a few rich, or uh, rich with a few poor? And depending on how you answer your question, the proportion between reciprocity and flexibility is different. Now, China is saying we are a poor country and some of us are rich. Now, the US Congress, average Congress woman or man, says uh, China is quasi like us, well, they still have a number of poor. But of course, depending on how you see things, then the consequences are very different. Uh, if, if I'm the, of the notion that China is like me with a few poor, I, I will want China to have the same chemical tariff as the one I have. Because after all, you know, we're competing with a country that's the same as ours. If I, on the contrary, if I understand that China is still a developing country, okay, I will admit that a 3% tariff difference on chemical products is not the end of the day. So this is, where, this is where this notion of emerging countries, in a way, has blocked the, the, the interpretation of the special differential treatment. It was fine as long as you know, developed were developed and developing were developing. Once you have countries in between, it's much more difficult to appreciate. And anyhow, in the new world of trade, Forget it, uh, which is why, by the way, uh, Annabelle, uh, remember that, which is why when I was DG of WTO, from the very beginning, I put quite a lot of emphasis on aid for trade, which is precisely, and that's where the Geneva Consensus comes in, which is precisely trying to create the conditions for, for instance, pesticide residues not to be an obstacle to trade, in providing Wanda with a 35 million dollars it needs to set up a domestic system of pesticide residue certification, which is okay scientifically and which is not corrupted. Not rocket science, but it's a different way of looking at trade. Let me just ask one follow-up question on China and the new world of trade and then turn it over to Fritz to close this portion of the discussion. I've been struck by the fact that uh, the trade among the emerging economies in particular China with the others, has become very contentious around issues like tariffs, uh, even in this new world of trade. So Brazil is a major soybean exporter, and China is their number one customer. China has imposed relatively high tariffs on all processed soybean products. And Brazil, from their point of view as a producer, wants to move up the value chain and process more soybeans. And there's a real conflict there in terms of the agreements between China and Brazil. And it seems like we see very similar things between sub-Saharan African countries like South Africa and China. We had the trade, uh, the industry minister of South Africa, 
uh, speak at uh, a, a conference we had in December 2012, where he was describing a system where South Africa's role is partly to join together with other sub-Saharan African countries to increase the amount of processing they do of their natural resource products. But in many of these cases, China wants to in, uh, import the unprocessed goods. Is there a way in which these kinds of disputes, levels of processing and the tariffs that are attached to that, are manageable in the, in the new world of trade? Or is this a kind of a, a throwback to, to ways in which tariffs still are, are pretty big obstacles among developing countries in terms of their trade relations? Well, I think I would opt for, for the second answer. I, 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 of course, I simplify a bit in saying the old world is dead and the new world is there. There's quite a bit of the old world which is still is there. And again, reasoning on averages is sometimes misleading, although you need that to get a sort of simplification of the reality. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, the, these countries have still quite archaic tariff structures, at least if you look at bound tariffs in WTO. I mean, India's average bound tariff is probably 45%. Brazil is 35%. Uh, Indonesia probably in the same range. China is 10%, which, by the way, says a lot about what happened when China joined the WTO. China joined the WTO on terms which were nearer to the standard of developed countries than to developing countries. Now, the average ag tariff of China in 01 when it joined the WTO, and I know that because I negotiated <laughs> the deal for Europe, is lower than the European ag average at the time. So let's make a difference between China on the one side, which is, let's say, a modern emerging country, and the rest of the older members of WTO, like India, like Brazil, like South Africa, like Egypt, like Indonesia, who benefited uh, from, from these very high bound tariffs. Now, this is bound tariffs. We all know that applied tariffs are very different depending uh, on economic cycles, depending in the case of agriculture on the sort of price, international price of commodities, uh, which after 30 years of depression is now on the rise for the next 20 or 30 years. So this makes, uh, this makes a big difference. But, you know, Brazil, during the economic crisis, was the only country on this planet that raised its tariffs to its bound level. Uh, the, before the crisis, the average applied probably was around 20. Uh, the average applied now is probably around 30. So it's the only case of a significant sort of magnitude mm -hmm. that really has gone backwards. Uh, whereas in other cases, it sometimes went up a bit through various, take Indonesia, for instance, export restrictions on raw materials. True, but in the same time, they reduced their ag tariff uh, in order co to control the price of food, because when food prices are increasing internationally, people you know, reduce their tariffs in order to avoid the impact of this on the, on the cost of living for, for, their, for their population. So there remain differences in this old world. <clears throat> and true, you know, there's, you've got a big problem between South Africa and Brazil on poultry, mm -hmm. and you've got huge problems in anti-dumping on, on textile and, and whatever, silk between India and China. Uh, so there is no reason why they wouldn't have this sort of friction. And, the, and this notion that because a clever guy at Goldman Sachs invented the notion of BRICS, uh, they are in the same pot. It's just crazy. Right. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the reality. And by the way, if there is a pot, then Mexico, Turkey, Indonesia <laughs> are, are in this pot. So true, there are these differences. There are tensions. 
this is what remains of the old world. But if you look at 20, 30 years from now, what will matter for them is who is in control of the food quality standard on poultry. This is what really matters. And whether this is done EU-US, whether this is done multilaterally, whether this is done elsewhere than EU-US or multilaterally. And these are interesting questions to investigate. Let me, uh, I know we want to open up yep. in, in uh, just a minute, so <coughs> I'll just ask one last question and we'll open up for, for, for questions. I, I actually, um, in a way, uh, it builds on this, but come back in a, it, to, to the conversation we were having a moment ago about uh, one aspect of the Washington Consensus, which is essentially about having sound policy at the national level um, to deal with everything from uh, how to facilitate the trade uh, on the one hand, but also things like the dealing with the, the, the social in, impact. Uh, bringing back to, the, to the, 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 this, this new world uh, of, of trade, or what we've been calling a GVC world, that is to say a world in which there are these uh, global value chains, often with large, powerful lead firms, mm -hmm. the suppliers, uh, uh, you know, they take various configurations, of course. But I'm curious what, what, what role you see for firms, or whether firms have a role beyond efficiency of production. Um, so this is the question, of, in a sense, about private governance mm -hmm. and the role of, 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 of uh, especially the lead firms in, in their supply chains to deal with things like the distributional impacts or, 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 to, or, 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 or even in the case that you were just talking about, the, to harmonize pesticide residues. It, it, to, to what extent can this happen or can part of this happen through private governance, through the, through the, through the governance regimes? Mm -hmm within these, these, these uh, value chains? Now, uh, before I answer your question, of course, one of the other big impacts of looking at uh, the world as a, a sum or a puzzle of global uh, supply chains uh, has to do, and I'm sure Annabelle will come back to that, uh, to the linkage between trade and investment. I mean, global supply chains reconnect these two approaches, although their regulation is still in different universes, except in new things like the TTIP, because in the meantime, the investment competence has been put at the EU level, uh, whereas it was at national <coughs> member states before. But this is, of course, an important dimension including in understanding uh, the sort of, you know, the sort of dynamics between uh, investment and, uh, and trade. Now, on, on your question, I mean, look, what I see, and I still spend 80% of my time uh, visiting uh, various bits and places of this planet, is that these private standards are now dominating. I mean, we will have serious discussions about this uh, during your, your summit. Uh, but in the, in the absence of proper multilateral regulatory framework for this precaution, not that there is nothing, there are plenty of bits and pieces. You have a Codex Alimentarius, you have a International Office for Animal Health, for Plant Health. There are bits and pieces of that. But most of that is patchy. And a lot of these areas of precaution uh, are not covered by any serious international sort of net of disciplines. And what's happening is that private standards are taking the lead. Those of you who are interested uh, that uh, should go to the uh, ITC, the International Trade Center website, uh, where they have, uh, they have put together a formidable database on private standards. So they don't look at, at public standards, they look at private standards. 
Uh, and they give you the topography of what you have to match if, uh, if you want to export your development. The ITC is specialized in uh, export, uh, developing countries uh, export promotion. And what it shows is that the map that really matters is the one with private standards. And there are more and more global supply chains are a propagator of public standards because it's the way consumer power at one end of the, of the chain can influence what happens on the source. If you look at you know, what happened after the Rana Plaza catastrophe in Bangladesh, uh, uh, it's, it's big brands who got a reaction by their consumers and then started being serious about imposing fire safety requirements uh, to Bangladesh. If you look at what's happening on the, uh, on the value chain of palm oil, for instance, and I looked at that in Indonesia uh, two months ago, following these <coughs> big campaigns by uh, you know, civil society that uh, palm oil uh, was uh, destroying uh, habitats, uh, whatever uh, kind of nice monkey, industry has reacted and has started inventing along the supply chain, a chain of sustainability certification, including, for instance, banking, provide banks providing trade finance, i.e. sort of letters of credit, against a sustainability certificate. Uh, and if you don't give the, the, the sustainability certificate, you don't get your letter of credit. Uh, if you don't get a letter of credit, you don't trade. Uh, so these things these things are happening. In many ways, they are less legitimate than public standards, for obvious reasons. Uh, they are more constraining. If I'm a producer of flowers, what matters is the standard of Tesco, Wellmart, and Carrefour. Uh, whether there is an any plant health organization somewhere doesn't matter. because, And as Tesco, Wellmart, and Carrefour have a tendency to compete on the ground that they are greener than their neighbor, they will raise the stringency of the pesticide residue standard for flowers. And what will matter for me if I'm a Kenyan or Ethiopian or Rwandan exporter, again, is what Tesco will now will do. So this, this, this is happening. It has its good side because it allows sort of collective preferences, which I happen to like politically, which is social standards, which is environmental standards. It has its good side because it's a way for these standards to be propagated along the chain. So in a way, I'm happy about that. Uh, uh, but if I sit on the side of those who have no say at all in the establishment of the standards, but who have to respect them, I probably would be a bit less happy. Great. OK, so I think uh, thank you very much for sort of uh, comments on a broad range of issues and a, and a vision that uh, you've been uh, um, developing over your years of experience. Let's open it up to the floor for comments. What I would suggest is the following. We have a mic, uh, microphone here that you should speak into for our recording purposes. And maybe it would be best just to collect uh, a few of your questions or yeah. comments or observations, and then we'll let uh, Mr. Lamy answer all of those or a, a round of those at the end in the interest of time. So anybody who has a question or a comment, please raise your hand, and then we'll, we'll pass the microphone. Don't be shy among the students here. Yes, go ahead. That's it. Let's get the microphone first, and then each person could pass it to the next. And you might, if you could just introduce yourself also when you ask your question. Uh, my name is Mahsat. I'm a second year fellow in my DP program here at Duke. I'm from Kazakhstan. Uh, my question is, I'm curious, when the WTO started to GVC analysis and how is the matter for the developing countries? Uh, I, can you repeat the first part of your question? When the WTO start the do GVC analysis? And uh, can you give the exact date or period when they started? This is 
Okay, so that's a very, uh, let's see, is there other question? Maybe we take a couple others if there are some or else we'll respond to this. Uh, let's see. Stephanie, did you have your hand up there? Yes, okay. Yes, yes. All right, anybody? Let's see, okay, Andrew, please. Uh, we'll get the mic. Uh, there's been talk Introduce about, yourself. So. Uh, my name is Andrew Gwynn. Uh, I'm a PhD student at UNC uh, in city and regional planning and economic development. I also work at the Center on Globalization, Governance, and Competitiveness here at Duke, uh, where I'm a research associate. Um, there's been talk in the last two, three, four years of a resurgence in industrial policy and industrial policy tools, especially among these emerging economies that we've been talking about. Under what conditions can industrial policy uh, kind of comport with this new world that you've been talking about uh, today? Okay. Okay. Uh, nice to meet you, Lami. My name is Tuo Wang. I come from China, and uh, I'm a PhD student. Uh, I have read your paper, The Global Value Chains, Interdependence, and the Future of Trade. Uh, in this paper, you mentioned that uh, the service are at the very heart of the value chains. And my question is that, um, what's the major problems faced by the WTO and uh, such, uh, uh, such organizations on the service trade? And uh, uh, how to analyze the service trade uh, with the global value chain framework? Thank you very much. Maybe one more question, one more. and then we'll, 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 we'll let uh, Pascal address that mm -hmm. round. My name is Sona. I'm a second year MIDP student. Uh, my main focus here is gender. So you were telling now that uh, along with global value chain, there is this sustainability chain. I would like to know if there is a gender dimension, if it's taken into account in the sustainability chain. Thank you. Okay, maybe we'll stop there, Pascal. That's a, uh, Broad range of questions. Some of them are quite broad. No, on, on the first one, uh, I'll have to relook at, <coughs> uh, at the dates. But no. the notion that WTO needed to provide a different narrative about how trade happens, why it happens, and how you should address subsequent to trade was, a cons in my mind, a consequence of the 08 <coughs> failure. When, again, reflecting on why it didn't work, I really came to the conclusion that had business been negotiating <laughs> instead of trade negotiators, it would have worked. So that's. So I started working in, uh, on this sort of made in the world in uh, 09, basically. Uh, the time it took to get there uh, sort of uh, was roughly 09, 010. And by the way, I realized at the time how internet had totally changed this research community. Uh, when when I started the sort of made in the world, which was the preliminary to measuring trade in value addition, mm -hmm. we had long discussions with my chief statistician and chief economist at the time, by the way, who is uh, part of your summit uh, tonight and, uh, and in the other in the coming days, uh, Patrick Lowe. And then we had the notion that in order to do that, we would have a huge problem with with the community of statisticians, who are even worse than trade negotiators, <laughs> uh, because getting a convention on statistics internationally would probably take 30 years. <laughs> so we said, uh, we will have problems with these guys. So we should have a, a sort of steering group where we should put them on board in order to create enough ownership. And, uh, the time we got to the notion that the steering group should be composed I mean, it was sort of eight months after. So we had another meeting, and I said, OK, so now how are we going to do our steering group? And then my chief statistician said, well, Mr. DG, my idea was to have the steering group, uh, and I convinced you to do that, and was very happy. Uh, but 
we don't need that anymore. And I said, well, why? Why did you spend, you know, you told me we should do that. Eight months we've been working on that. He said, well, it's gone already. It's on internet. The Groningen University, who happened to have worked on that, connected with the Central Bank of Korea, who had a good research department. The ITC in Washington, guy called Kopman, jumped on the thing. Oh, I've been doing calculations on this for a long time. Blong, 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 blong. And these guys never asked their boss whether they should do the bloody numbers and the input-output table. They started doing this at night and during weekends, and boom, 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 the thing worked. Uh, and that's great. Uh, it's a totally different approach. It was never decided, never negotiated, never institutionalized. But the dynamic was that at some moment, we got the numbers which allowed WTO and OECD to refine them and put them in the public uh, without any sort of you know, the normal steps which one would take to build a process like this. And we, 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 we put the, when I launched this, in my mind at least in 08, 09, I thought it would take 20 years before we get the first number, because <laughs> I, I was explained why input output table on the export and import side were different from the ones you use to calculate your value addition to compute your GNP. And I was convinced it was very complex. I said, OK, let's, let's do this step by step. No, and it took not even five years before we delivered with the OECD the first batch of, of proper numbers, which, true, if you look at them, give you a different picture of what world trade is about. On industrial policy, I mean, it all depends on what you call industrial policy. Right? If it's about the old sort of prebish uh, domestic uh, substitution, uh, forget it. I know there is still a school of thought on this, and that uh, Argentinian economists and policymakers and Brazilian economists and policymakers will still make the case that this is the road to follow. Uh, by the way, this is the place where there is a ideological resistance to the notion of global value change. Huh? If you look at ONCTAD work on global value change, you can see that it's inspired by a doctrine that these global value chains are nothing more than uh, the new imperium of multinational capitalist uh, firms that try to impose uh, food standards and labor standards and, and so on. I'm not saying they're not powerful. They are powerful and sometimes too powerful. Uh, but th there is a coincidence between economists of countries who are not integrated in global supply chains and the view they have about global supply chain. If you take Latin America, for instance, and Annabelle will probably be much more qualified than me to, you now have two camps. Huh? You have the Pacific Alliance, who's in full game because they've understood the concept, and they are building more and more global supply chains in the region and, and with Asia. And then you've got Brazil uh, and, uh, uh, and Argentina, who are in a different planet. Uh, and, and Uruguay regretting that they sh they're not on the other side, uh, because that's where their mind is. But too bad for them, <laughs> they are on the Atlantic side. Uh. So apart from that, plus a bit of South Africa, uh, and it's all fun, I've sometimes disagreed, sometimes agreed with uh, Rob Davies, which uh, you mentioned. And it's all fun to see Rob Davies uh, uh, criticizing the concept of global supply chain mm -hmm. in Antad and elaborating on the complex, on the, on the concept of global supply chain when it's about intra-African uh, integration. Huh? <laughs> he has a double, <laughs> double speak, because of course, one of the comparative advantages of South Africa in Africa is that they, they are one of the main elements of what could possibly be extended supply chains in, in Africa. So if it's about, again, if it's about 
import substitution, forget it. If it's about more attention to logistics, uh, to the capacity of transport systems uh, to bring uh, things at a place to another one. If it's about uh, more attention to qualification, while recognizing that the frontier between goods and services is now becoming extremely blurred, uh, if you look at what you call uh, in French uh, l'industrie servicielle, uh, uh, which is the sort of growing gray zone between uh, industry and services. Uh, uh, and by the way, this impacts very seriously numbers on disindustrialization or reindustrialization, depending on what concept you take of industry. Yeah, there is room for an industrial policy. Or more precisely, there is room for a public policy, the purpose of which is to increase the part of your economy which you grow through participation in international trade. True, and like this, I mean, there, there, is a, there is an obvious, uh, obvious connection. Uh, third question, again, the, this whole issue about you know, invest WTO leading the pack in conceptualizing the new world of trade as global supply chain had, as I said previously, an operational purpose, which was to put the focus on what matters in terms of optical to trade. Uh, WTO is not, uh, it's not an academy, uh, <laughs> it's not the university. But you need proper concepts in order to frame your operational agenda. And again, as long as you've got the, you've got the old one, you focus on what doesn't matter anymore, and you don't focus on what will matter most five or ten years from now. So the, this, is, this is the operational, this is the operational uh, purpose. Uh, on women, I mean, I've always been convinced, and that's what numbers tell us, and that uh, I, more trade is a formidable empowerment for women. And that's, you know, that's what numbers show in Asia, in Africa, uh, in, uh, in uh, agriculture, in uh, whatever sort of, you know, uh, sort of first stages of, of production in developing countries. Uh, and by the way, uh, it's, women are very good at that. Uh, and uh, if I look at what the ITC, for instance, is doing on on export promotion in developing countries, the most dynamic constituency pushing for that and bringing new ideas on the table are sort of uh, women, uh, women gatherings and clubs and constituencies. And that's, you know, it's, I, we should ask anthropologists uh, why it is so. I have my intuitions, but I'm not qualified enough in ethnology or anthropology to give a sort of solid scientific answer. Okay, well, I think uh, we've had an extremely, uh, I think, insightful conversation instead of comments from Pascal Lamy. And uh, looking at our agenda and the timetable, I think this is a good moment to end this discussion. Uh, and uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Pascal Lamy for sharing his thoughts with us over this lunchtime session. Very good.